maybe maybe what we should start doing is is introducing ourselves. Uh, I'm Ken By Allen. I'm in New York. Ken. Uh, retired from gainful employment now after a couple of careers. Um, a Dharma successor of Bernie Glassman's. Uh, and uh, during during COVID, uh, three of Bernie's successors were were getting together every week, uh, and uh, came up with a with a project uh, to keep ourselves busy, uh, which was to reach out to everybody else in Bernie's family. Uh, oh. idiot family, which Bernie defined as people he's he'd given transmission to, uh, but also people who had received transmission from other teachers to whom he gave Inca the you know the in Soto the final seal of approval. So there are people in the family. And who had other teachers, but ended up working with Bernie and forming a bond with Bernie, and, and he recognized them. Uh, so we asked all of them to contribute the stories about Bernie uh, that they used like the story that they used most frequently in their teaching, the story about Bernie that they used. Uh, and uh, almost, almost everyone who was alive at the time we did the book uh, contributed. I think there were three, no, two, two living successors, I think, who opted not to participate. Uh, in most cases where where the teacher had passed, the successor had passed, we asked their first successor to contribute the story that they had heard most about Bernie most frequently, most importantly, whatever from their teacher. Uh, and those are the story, you know, these are the stories that we call the Bernie Cohen's. Uh, so I think, you know, as with, with each year that passes, uh, uh, there are more and more people in the in the Zen Peacemaker network who never really got to know Bernie. Uh, but one of, the, one of the things that this collection of stories does is to give you who never who didn't get to know him in person, in the flesh, uh, an opportunity to, to get to know him. Uh, and for us all to work together with, with his teaching, uh, and we're trying to do this. This is we're calling this Cohen study, right? Uh, how many of you ra raise your hand if you have any experience doing Cohen's? So help me orient. About half the group has some experience doing Cohen's. About half doesn't. Uh, so the guideline on doing Cohen's is you got to put yourself on the line. If you don't put yourself on the line, you don't get much. Uh, so that's like the encouragement to participate. I'm not going to embarrass anybody if I can help it. Uh, but, uh, you know, sticking your neck out, stepping from the 100-foot pole uh, is the way we learn. Uh, we really know that. Uh, yeah, when we watch children learn to walk, 
uh, little kids don't learn to walk by reading books about walking. And they don't learn to walk by watching videos on YouTube. Uh, they get up and they try walking and they fall down and they get up again and they keep trying. And that's how they learn to walk. Uh, and that's, that's closer to koan practice uh, as a way of getting into Zen. And it's really the way to get into Zen, not studying Zen books. Uh, that's sort of the intro and who I am. Uh, and we go around the room in whatever order you like and tell us at least who you are and a little bit about your practice if you want to, where you're sitting and that kind of thing. Oh, Leo, go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, my name is Muyo Swanson. I've been Muyo Swanson ever since Jukai. My Christian name was Kenneth. Um, I'm a Shin Zen minister, chaplain. Um, I live out in Port Thompson, Washington, where we had a heat wave that got up to 81 degrees up here. <laughs> uh, I'm right across from uh, British Columbia on the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Um, when, funny thing is, when we, I was reading through the book, uh, Wendy Nakel uh, was my mentor. I was assigned to her when I joined the Peacemakers. And the first thing she ever told me was, everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing himself. And, you know, that kind of stuck with me for an awful long time. And that's basically where I am right now. I'm um, Susan, and I'm here in the beautiful, progressive state of Arizona. <laughs> Originally, I'm from Colorado, which is paradise. Um, and I uh, have been practicing for about sitting zazen for 25 years and uh, working with Joan Halifax and I go up to Santa Fe to the Upaya Zen Center. Um, and I've kind of been lax and haven't been sitting lately, which is really suffering. I'm avoiding sitting. <laughs> so I've got to figure out some way to retrieve my practice because I really miss it. I was a nurse for 40 years. I went in as kind of a bleeding heart young girl who's going to save everybody and take care of everybody. And now I'm 81. And I look back and I think, what was I thinking? How sick and demented. <laughs> and really, it's just shocking to be 81 and think that I did that. So that's my story. My name is Dale Goldstein. I live in Rochester, New York. I'm a Detroit native. I moved here in 1971 to practice Zen with Philip Gaplow. Practiced with him for 10 years. Worked on Mu. All my friends and relatives except one 
past Mu. I didn't. I never understood. Still don't understand how to work with koans. Um, my hope is to figure out how to work with koans and maybe maybe pass Mu before I die. But uh, I worked with Tony Packer for six years after I left the Zen Center in 81. And she essentially, she was the first Dharma heir of Philip Kaplow, who he later uh, disowned. Um, and she gave me permission to find my own way, which was very helpful. Uh, my second Zen teacher was Nancy Mujo Baker, who accused me of practicing Sinatra Zen. I did it my way, <laughs> which I can laugh about now. Um, <laughs> but I still didn't learn how to work with koans, and she wasn't teaching koans anyway. But then um, I... Her sangha wasn't what I was looking for. She wasn't a teacher I was looking for. I'd known Nancy for 10 years prior to becoming her student. And we had a friendship. And I think the friendship got confused when she became my teacher. So I looked around and I saw Ken Roshi Ken's group here. And I said, oh, maybe I can figure out how to work with koans in a group. <laughs> So I joined, and um, I feel like I found my Zen teacher. And um, I think the thing I appreciate most about Roshi Ken is previous Zen teachers I've had were Zen teachers first, my perspective, and human beings second. And I feel it's reverse with Ken, and I really appreciate it. I have a background in psychotherapy. I practiced as a therapist for 50 years. And I think uh, Ken's understanding of both therapy and Zen is going to be very helpful to me. Hi, I'm Anna. Um living in Los Angeles, the um, unceded territory of the Tongva. I um, came to uh, this group um, because I've attended a couple of bearing witness retreats with uh, the Zen peacemakers. The first one was in um, South Dakota, and then I've gone to the um, two of them in Alabama. And at one of the ones in Alabama, I met, um, well, both of them, Paco was there. I don't know Paco's last name, but I'm sure you guys are familiar. And he gave me, okay, you can't see it, but um, he gave me the Bernie Cohen book, which has been sitting on my nightstand for, I don't know how long. And um, uh, yes, like um, I believe Dell said, like, I feel uh, kind of, um, uh, yeah, like um, yeah, koans, the thought of koans stressed me out. <laughs> And I haven't actually formally taken up the practice, but when I opened the book, um, I was like, okay, this is actually like, they're not like 30 pages long. So I could maybe like have an understand. I don't know. Um, so I'm interested and like, like um, also like Dale said, it's nice to be in a group where we're doing it together. Cause I think the idea of doing it one-on-one -on -one is like super scary for somebody who has like, <laughs> Um, yeah, who anticipates it's going to be difficult, but, um, yeah, so I think that's, I think that's enough about me. Thank you. I'm, I'm Todd, or uh, Lucian. Um, I've been working uh, with a teacher named uh, Stephen Mugen Snyder for a couple of years and working on koans. And then uh, his teacher is Mark uh, Sando Minenberg, who's um, in this book. And then I just found out about this book and just bought it this uh, past weekend and saw this was um, going on, so signed up. So there I am, happy to be with you all. Yeah, thanks. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Jerry. Uh, so I've been practicing for about 20 years. Uh, and uh, my teacher now is Sarah Bender Roshi, who's uh, uh, from the open source tradition and the Joan Sutherland, her Dharma here, uh, Dharma here of Joan Sutherland. Uh, but I've uh, spent a fair amount of time in uh, uh, in other traditions in the Vasana Theravada, and uh, and I did uh, go to a program at Naropa for a couple of years uh, uh, in the Shambhala tradition. So I kind of uh, have a uh, you know a more casual attitude about uh, being a true uh, Zen uh, uh, student, but I do appreciate a lot of the uh, uh, the koan studies, though as some other folks have said, a lot of it goes uh, either over my head or under my gut somehow. And uh, the ones that I do connect with, though, I, I found very useful. And uh, I lead a small group here uh, at an over 55 community. And so we meet weekly and sit and discuss uh, various uh, traditions and teachings. Uh, and I'm also involved. I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I'm involved with that community. Uh, the Albuquerque Insight Meditation Center. So that's me. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Kalim, and I apologize. I had a doctor's appointment that went longer than expected. Um, so I'm gathering people are introducing themselves. And um, so... Um, I'm, I'm looking to get closer to Bernie, um, I, in whatever way possible. I, I met Bernie years ago in Yonkers for a day's sitting and, um, have read some of his work and been very impressed with his, his work and his vision. Um, and, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm looking to get closer to this, um, to Ken as well. And, and um, my, my original teacher, Mui Baragato, um, back in 99, 2000, was a student of Bernie's and Maizumi Roshi, that lineage. And um, uh, <laughs> I suppose... Just to finish, Mui did his own form of a koan practice when um, he, we were part of a very intimate small sangha. And one day, Bernie, uh, Bernie, one day, Mui came in and said, Well, Margaret and I are we're moving to Maine. And so off they went, and the sangha couldn't hold together or chose not to with their departure. Um, so, so that's been a working call on everything. <laughs> so hello. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, I'm another Susan from Arizona and I'm outside of Sedona, so not quite as hot, but almost. Um, I'm a writer, and my teacher is Natalie Goldberg, and that's where I sort of learned about Zen. And I've come to a couple of the core teachings with Zen Peacemaker. But the real reason I'm here is very strange. Um, I think it's a Sinatra Zen, which I love. I'm stealing that, if that's okay. Um, so my neurosurgeon's name is Bernie. I have a brain tumor. I have two brain tumors. And I feel as though five years ago when he saved my life, he gave me my koan and it's called Watch and Wait. It's a medical protocol, but it's morphed into my spiritual practice. And then I read the book Householder's Koan. And I'm like, yeah, that's my koan. So I came here to learn how to work with koans. And that's my word story. Thanks. Hey, 
Hey y'all, um, I'm Quinn. I'm uh, here in New Orleans, Louisiana. I am a novice practitioner. I'm really happy to be here with y'all um, amongst esteemed company. Um, I have been um, working with mindfulness and uh, um, some Zen practice for about five or six years. Um, and I have a group of autonomous practitioners, I guess, kind of the Sinatra fam, you know, the little rat pack, you know, going on um, at a friend's home, John Clark of Loyola University, he's a philosophy professor. Um, and we have done a co uh, Cohen study after our sits. Um, but he's since moved on to do Tao Te Ching, and I wanted to keep working with koans, so that's why I'm here. Um, and I just happened upon the Zen Peacemakers through looking for koan study, so that is how I am involved at all. I don't know anything about Zen Peacemakers. I'm very excited to learn about it, um, and I'm very happy to be here, so thank you for uh, creating this space. Ken, it's a pleasure, and everyone else, I look forward to chatting with you as well. Thank you. I think we're ready to plunge in. Uh, if, does someone else have the book that they would like to read? From page 15, it's short, half a page. You have another volunteer, are you gonna make me read? Good, good, thank you. So this is Nancy Mujo Baker. Can you hear me okay? Uh, the case. During an informal Dharma talk, Bernie told a story about an enlightened Zen master who wanted to be a hermit and went to live in a small cabin in the woods. He didn't do a good job of keeping it monastic style, neat and clean. It was basically a mess. One day he saw out the window, coming through the forest, the abbot of his monastery. He was so embarrassed about the mess that he hid behind the stove. Diane Shainberg raised her hand and said, Sensei, how can an, an enlightened Zen master be embarrassed? Without missing a beat, Bernie bellowed, he was thoroughly embarrassed. Read it in for a second, if, it's, if you haven't read it before. See what comes up. Share what's through. Someone will take a chance and share what's coming up for them will get us going. Uh, so I, I mean, what comes up for me is just that um, enlightenment and tidiness are not the same thing. <laughs> enlightenment and what? And tidiness <laughs> aren't the same thing. <laughs> What comes up for oh, oh. Okay. Um, Go ahead. um yeah, what comes up for me is that it appears that Bernie's speaking about himself in the third person, which is very confusing to me. Unless I don't understand it. Oh, it's interesting. Oh, what comes up for me is uh wait, wait, let's just I just want to clarify that. Oh Bernie told the story about a monk, uh, when he says he was thoroughly embarrassed, he's talking about the monk. Okay, sorry. Yeah, that was my first time hearing it. So yeah, yeah. sorry about that. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I interrupted someone. Uh, maybe I didn't understand the con. I, if somebody could read it again, that would be great. We have another no. read volunteer. I don't have the book, so I can't read it. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Shalom, you gonna do it? Sure. Oh, that's a be happy to. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Nancy Mujo Baker, the case. During an informal Dharma talk, Bernie, 
told a story about an enlightened Zen master who wanted to be a hermit and went to live in a small cabin in the woods. He didn't do a good job of keeping it monastic style, neat and clean. It was a basically, it was a basic, it was a basically a mess. Oh, it was basically a mess. One day he saw out the window coming through the forest, the abbot of his monastery. He was so embarrassed about the mess that he hid behind the stove. Diane Shainberg raised her hand and said, Sensei, how can an enlightened Zen master be embarrassed? Without missing a beat, Bernie bellowed, he was thoroughly embarrassed. <laughs> Thank you so much for reading that again. So what came up for me is that this... <laughs> And I had um, read this somewhere too, is um, is there's a saying, don't be part of the problem, be the whole problem. In other words, lean into it and own it. <laughs> and so it's kind of a lesson of actually the messy hut was the con to own that mess to be the mess and still present yourself thank you um i dale were you going to go no oh. um i i would kind of hand in hand with what you just said susan I I would I I'm I really appreciate getting working identifying and reading this my own delusion about somehow the idea that enlightened means I'm no longer going to be human I'm not going to have all these emotions these feelings including embarrassment and and so in reading this I'm really kind of reassured with be human be fully human. And and I I I've been sort of living with Ryokan the last year. And one of the things I admire about his writing is how he's so genuinely human, whether it's being happy, whether it's being sad, whether it's being lonely, whether it's crying. It's all human. And that's what I'm looking for. In, in this work is being more in touch with my fullness of humanity as it may shift, as it may change. So I was going to share a personal story. Um, I had prostate cancer a while ago. I don't know, 11 years ago, something like that. And I found out the day before I went into a nine-day retreat from my urologist that if I didn't do something about it soon, I was going to die. So I go into this retreat. I wake up every morning at 4.30, really scared. You know, I could become incontinent, could become impotent, and I could die. By the end of the retreat, I had come to impotent Buddha, incontinent Buddha, doesn't change who I really am. But dying, I'm not so sure. So, uh, about two months later, this Tibetan Lama who I've done some work with uh, was giving a retreat about a half an hour south of Rochester. It's an old man, Garchin Rinpoche, and he doesn't do private interviews, but he agreed to see me. We had some karmic connection, probably. So I go into the room where he's sitting in bed, and uh, the the uh, interpreter tells him why I'm there. I sit in the chair next to him. He closes his eyes, puts his hand on my knee, and sends me some good juju, you know. Then he opens his eyes. He puts his hand on my hands. He looks me right in the eye, and he says, you're going to die. What was I thinking? <laughs> That I wasn't going to die. So I've really been happy ever since that moment. 
But then the postscript is what I wanted to share. Um, a friend of mine, Rafe Martin, after 50 years of practice, became a teacher. And I took him out to, to lunch to celebrate. And I told him this story. And I said, but I kind of expect that I might be scared when I'm actually facing death. And he looked at me and he said, frightened Buddha. Frightened Buddha. I've been slowly reading through um, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, and I just yesterday got to a section talking about attachment and non-attachment, and there was um, the example of uh, talking about your, your own attachment is Buddha's attachment. So this is kind of the same thing you just said, but in a different way. Um, like if you're feeling embarrassed, that's Buddha's embarrassment. Yeah, same thing. Bernie's one of Bernie's favorite stories. Uh, it's about his first meeting with Taizan Mayazumi, who was not yet a teacher, but had come to Los Angeles to help translate for the, the, the Soto Bishop in Los Angeles. And Bernie was getting into, into Zen and found this Soto place. It was really a, a place for the basically the, the immigrant community. Not many Westerners there. Uh, but Bernie went. And at the, at the end of the evening, he goes up to ask, ask the bishop, uh, who didn't speak much English, uh, what 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 what's the purpose of this? Uh, what are we doing? What's the purpose when we do the walking meditation? And uh, the bishop just just gestures, sort of, you know, for for Mayazumi to answer the question. Or, you know, so, you know, what's the purpose of the walking meditation? And Mayazumi says, "When we walk, we walk." Bernie had an experience a lot like this uh, this monks, but really a pointed pointed to attachment in a, in a in an even stronger way, I think. Uh, Jishu Jishu Holmes was the co-founder with Bernie of of the Zen peacemaker order, Zen peacemakers. It's his second wife. Uh, and she died very suddenly. Uh, and, and Bernie was thrown into this grief. Uh, almost a year. Uh, he basically did almost nothing except mourn for you. There are a few exceptions, but his main activity was mourning. Uh, and somebody asked him that question. There was another one of you, one of you shared a version of the story, you know, but Bernie was asked, uh, uh, I, I, I thought Zen masters were supposed to be free of attachment. 
How can you be experiencing loss? Now, I wish I remembered Bernie's answer. <laughs> I, remember, I, remember the, I remember the message. Uh, the message was that they're both going, two things are going on at the same time. Uh, you're, and, and he went through the loss. He came out the other side. Uh, and it was a hard koan for him. Uh, Bernie particularly when he was younger was was a kind of harsh character in a lot of ways. He was not an easy teacher. Uh, some of the people who knew him at, in, in the ZCLA days remember him as terrifying. Uh, Jisha was a good partner for him, he found, because she brought softness to his life. And Jisha created some balance for him in relationships with other people. Um, when Jisha died, Bernie didn't have Jisha to kind of uh, smooth some of his rough spots for him. And he realized he had to become his own Jishu. Uh, he had to begin to manifest some of the Jishu side of himself. wasn't easy for him. How do you work with this koan? Uh, that was a question that some of you came to this group with, I heard. You know, it's like, how do you work with a koan? Uh, which is something other than commenting on the koan. Uh, you know, it's a question is of like, the challenge often as presented is to become the koan. Uh, no, none of my teachers actually ever gave me any idea how to do that. Uh, but I got this wonderful lesson uh, from a fellow Zen student, uh, which I will share with you because I've been sharing it with everybody that it was, uh, showed me a way uh, uh, happens to be one of Bernie's more famous students. Uh, the, I'm sure you, many of you will be familiar with her. Uh, the actress Ellen Burstein. Uh, I mean, she's still acting. She's amazing. Uh, I mean, at the time, I think at the time I met her, I may have just seen uh, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. Uh, and, you know, sort of be, being in the same room 
with her was just you know, wow. Uh, and we were talking about koans, and she gave me the clue. Uh, that uh, she said the way that the way she, I don't know if she said this was the way she did it, but the way she recommended doing it, I guess, uh, was the same way that you, she was trained in the actor's studio to become, you know, like a person in a movie, you know, a character. Uh, you know, and it was, it was, you know, this is, this is this, you know, Stanislavski method brought to America. Uh, and uh, you really become, become the person who you're portraying. You know, and she would say, you know, you take a koan. The koans, most of the koans are little stories like this one that we just read. Uh, this is a simple story. It's only got two characters in it, maybe. Well, the story Bernie tells has two characters. The story Mujo tells has four characters, right? So you got the monk and the abbot, and you got Bernie, and you got Diane Shaneberg. And if you're going to dramatize this, you could be any of those parts. And in different moments, you could be, you could play each of the parts. Uh, who's, and, and I'm not sure whether Ellen recommended this or this is my addition to the method. Uh, but my recommendation is that you enter through the part that's easiest for you to enter in. Don't make life difficult for yourself. Uh, who's the e which is the easiest part for you? Uh, and I had that. I had Ellen's story in my head. It was the only rec only advice I had when uh, I started koan study for the third time. I had started with Jishu before she died. Bernie tried to pick it up. He was in La Honda outside of San Francisco. I was in Staten Island. We tried to do it by email. Uh, I got my first email account in order to do koan study with Bernie. He tried it for, I don't know, once or twice and decided this was not working and sent me to uh, Roshi Bob Kennedy in Jersey City. So I started again with, with Bob. Uh, and uh, a couple of you referred to Moo, right? Uh, so I, what do I do with Moo? Uh, I mean, I, I think by that time I knew that what I wasn't supposed to do uh, was, was go in and uh, tell Bob about Moo. But what what do I make of this? Uh, I. That came to I, I came to Ellen's method and my my version of Ellen's method. I got three characters in this story, right? Do you know Do you know the Moo story? Everybody know Moo. No, so uh, quickly, uh, Anna Moo, uh, this monk goes to Chow Cho and asks him, "Does a dog have Buddha nature?" And Chow Cho says, "Moo," which means something like "not." It's like a it's not exactly a word. It's sort of like a negative. It doesn't really translate. Uh, I look at the story. I got three characters. 
I got a monk uh, chow cho and the dog. And I said, well, what's my what's my entry point here? What do you think my entry point was? The really, dog. there was the dog. Uh, so I uh, crawled around Bob's uh, Dokusan room, peed in the corner, you know, lifted my leg, peed in the corner, uh, crawled back, put my head in his lap. Uh, he told me to go on to the next koan. It was probably 10 years before I could enter as the monk. Uh, but I, and another, I don't know, five, six, seven years before I could enter as Chow Cho. Take the easy entry point. Uh, you know, I, I would simplify it now, you know? I'd say you got you got all these dialogues between monks who are having a hard time getting it and these greatly enlightened teachers. Uh, you think your way in is by becoming the greatly enlightened teacher, poof, just like that? Probably not. Try the stupid monk. Much easier for most of us. Muyo. Now, I, um, after reading that, I was digging through my books, and what I took from that was don't go into the tangled jungle looking for the great awakened elephant who is already resting quietly at home in front of your own hearth. So here, the Zen master went trying to find the elephant. And the, the um, uh, when the uh, abbot comes, the abbot represents the elephant to me. So the, the abbot basically tells them everything you're looking for is already there. You don't have to go into the woods. Uh, kind of commenting on a, on a on a koan is different than koan practice. Uh, yeah, that can get in our in, even in our Zen world that can get confusing uh, because most of us, you know, before we get to koans, koan practice, get introduced to koans through the talks of teachers that we hear. Uh, and the truth is, from my point of view, the sad truth is that a lot of Taishos are talks about koans. Uh, they may be interesting or not interesting talks. They may be inspiring or not inspiring talks. Uh, but what's being shown? Dale. I want to stick my neck out here. Uh, back in the mid-70s, I trained in a 
healing art called polarity therapy. And uh, it was a six week training. And I was, I was smart. I was born with certain native intelligence. And I prided myself on being the smartest person in the group. And for the oral final exam, teacher asked me a question that I didn't know the answer to. And that identity of being smart was dealt a serious blow. So I'm the monk. I took the, the hit. I felt really deflated, ashamed, embarrassed. I felt it fully. I couldn't speak. It was devastating. So pointing a little bit to how do you work with this koan now? Uh, and it's different for each of us. Uh, it may be uh, one way of one way of jumping in uh, might be to go back to your most embarrassing moment. Uh, Susan. Um, for me, this con was a visceral experience. Being a woman who's had a messy house plenty of times and people coming to visit, I would hide behind the stove. So it wasn't an abstract thing for me. I could feel it. I could feel the terror of the abbot coming. <laughs> and I could feel the security of being behind the stove. So thank you. <laughs> I've lived, I lived through that a bunch of times with Bernie. Uh, when we were in Yonkers, every year or so, I guess, Mayazumi would come, come through on a visit, Bernie's teacher. Uh, and particularly if he was going to be there, you know, on the Saturday morning when there was going to be a service. Uh, you know, Bernie would be like a wild man. Uh, that that you know, like you know, everything had to be so clean. Uh, you know, and even worse than that, uh, you know, there were all these there were all these different positions and, and instruments and stuff that we played in the service. You know, and you'd get assigned to, and you do the best you can, you know, and. Bernie was never crazy. You know, we we were learning, you know, except when Maizumi was going to be there. Uh, you know, and it's like, uh, you know, this is stuff I, some of this stuff I haven't done in 25 years. I don't remember. The, there's this thing where you banged on this wooden thing, you know, be the kind of the beginning, you know, to, to call people to, 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 the, to the Zendo and, uh, uh, you know, getting it right. And there was this big drum that you beat with two hands. Oh my God. You know, it was like, uh, it, it was, it was crazy. And then Mayasumi would leave and Bernie would relax again. Uh, it was important to him. Uh, and what was important to him, I guess, I look back on it. Uh, was it was his way of showing his respect for his teacher because it was something that was important to Maizumi so it would be important to him uh, I saw it again uh as I was preparing for Tokido, that's the the head shaving, home leaving ceremony. That's the beginning of the priest path. Uh, 
And I remember saying to Bernie, I know I have to shave my head, shave my head, but Tokino, but do I have to shave my beard? And without missing a beat, Bernie responded, as long as my Izumi is alive. Uh, and Bernie's head was shaved. Always. As long as my Izumi was alive. I mean, I didn't, most of us, I didn't keep my head shaved after uh, after Tokido. After Tokido, I let my hair grow back. But my Bernie kept his head shaved until after my Izumi died. Then he grew his hair, had a ponytail and a beard. Can you go back to your most embarrassing moment? Then you forget that that's a bad question. Can you go back to a embarrassing moment, an embarrassing moment? Uh, as you work with embarrassment, As you go deeper, you will go to more embarrassing moments. To me, it's um, it's not like embarrassment is just one element of it. It's like uh, discomfort and like, what do you do when you feel uncomfortable? And I mean, I guess I'm putting myself into it. Um, because yes, I can definitely enter through the monk in that situation. And I think honestly, the reason I'm here and still involved with uh, Zen is a very similar kind of recognition, or I, I don't know if the monk actually has the recognition, but um, that that's what I do when I feel uncomfortable is I r run and I run in my head and I physically run and I all sorts of things. And I remember having that realization during Zazen and how incredibly powerful that was for me. And really, um, that's, I'm still working with that, obviously. And I still, I still feel myself, um, yeah, running is, is how I would see it, running from discomfort. That's one of the big powers, I think, of Zazen, right? As you do this practice, which you know, I'm going to sit here for 30 minutes, uh, no matter what. Uh, you know, I'm going to have this thought, I think I left the teapot on. Uh, and I'm just going to sit with this fear that I left the teapot on. I'm not going to run into the kitchen to just make sure I turn the flame off on the teapot. You know, and then the thought is going to come up. If I don't wiggle my toes, I may never walk again. And I'm just going to sit there and not wiggle my toes. And then I'm going to thought that if I don't scratch my nose, I could go insane. And I'm not going to scratch. Then the bell rings and I can wiggle and scratch and go check the teapot. But I don't run around for 30 minutes. Uh, I can even I can even distract myself. That's cheating. Uh, but when I was starting out doing Zazen, I cheated all the time. How did I cheat? I remember like in my first session, the way I cheated was like trying to remember, I was a baseball fan, sports fan, baseball fan as a kid. And I'm trying to remember everybody was on the Brooklyn Dodgers when I was 10 years old. Uh, and then everybody who was on the Yankees that year and everybody was on the Giants. And I'm, you know, and and I, the session went on and on. And I went on to basketball teams and hockey teams, uh, you know. 
anything to get my mind off whatever was going to get me up running around. That was cheating. Uh, you know, Jisha told me, you know, this is a couple of years later, you know, like, you know, like, what do you do about the pain in your knee? Uh, which is comes up for most of us pretty early in our practice. Uh, you know, and the first thing you do is just try to come back to your breath. You focus on your breath. And somehow, if you can do that, miraculously, the pain goes away. But sometimes it doesn't work. What do you do? She said, then just become the pain. Just become the pain. And then miraculously, the pain goes away, too. Just the pain. But go with the stories. Just be the pain. Anybody else got an embarrassment story they want to share? Um, oh, go ahead, Susan. Okay, thank you. Uh, so in the beginning of my medical adventure, I was, before my surgery, I was in serious cognitive decline and having to go through cognitive assessment. And I couldn't answer the questions. The neurology, the, yeah, they were throwing math problems at me and I've always been crap at math. So I don't even know if it was a brain tumor or not, but and I asked her, my neuro-oncologist, who I hated at the time because I was so embarrassed that I couldn't do basic responses. And um, I said, can I, she said, well, what's the date? I'm like, can I use my phone? No. <laughs> um, and later on, I said, you know, I really hated you at that time. And she goes, why? Because I wouldn't let you cheat. And I realized after processing the embarrassment being aware of it at the same time and that that was cheating using my phone so when you said cheating that kind of clicked for me too and put these two things together thank you you're reminding me of uh when i was beginning in psychiatry i was sitting in on a mental status exam that one of the psych residents was doing and he was asking this poor person who had ended up in our care what the date was and this poor old black guy is struggling to answer the question uh, and comes up with something you know and then the psych resident looks at his watch you know to check the date I did, I did take my mother toward the end of her life. Uh, she had Alzheimer's, it turned out. But I took her for a, a neurological exam. You're reminding me of this, Susan. Uh, my, my, mother, my mother was more experienced, I guess, in living with this situation than you were at that moment. So she had developed a lot of skills <laughs> which I hadn't noticed, but I, I saw them when sitting with her and this very nice young neurologist. Uh, and the neurologist uh, asks her, you know, something about the you know what day of it is or what date, you know. And my mother says, "Come on, Doc, you know the answer to that question." She did that all. I never noticed it. <laughs> she had a way of, you know, of of at that point in hiding or disguising uh, 
what would have been embarrassing uh, if if it, she had been called on it. Muyo. Uh, for me, it was I. My teachers had me write my whole life's story. And they would quiz me on, did you learn anything? Did you learn anything with this? And they finally came up with my name, Muyo. And fast forward 15 years, I went to visit our daughter at Green Gulch, who was doing an internship there. And there was one of my teachers, and she said, after all these years, tell me what you learned. And I was kind of taken back that she would remember this. So for me, that was an embarrassing moment. Uh, so when you do koan, uh, you, Bernie shows this in this story. I mean, Mujo, Mujo shows it, you know, kind of typographically. You guys who don't have it in front of you can't see it. Uh, but the way it's done typographically is when Bernie bellows, he was thoroughly embarrassed. Thoroughly embarrassed is all in caps. Uh, show me the story. Of uh, my adventure with <laughs> Chow Chow's dog, you know? Uh, I can't tell the story. It's just not I, you know, I didn't pass, you know, Bob didn't pass me on this koan because I told him the story, you know, about, uh, you know, I could crawl around the office and then I could do this and then I could do that, you know? Show me. Uh, Uh, it's hard to do. Uh, it's challenging to take this on in a group. Uh, What do you do? When Bernie was talking about a koan, you could see it. Bernie would become the koan. Not easy. Uh, we don't, none of us get it all at once. Uh, You know, there's a, uh, I find it intriguing, but there are, there, there are Korean Zen lineages in which a student does only one koan. Teacher picks a koan for the student and that's, that's their whole practice is to work on that koan. 
of I'm intrigued by that, but I don't want to do that. Uh, I like I like to have lots of chances. Coming back to Ellen's vision of how to do koans, uh, you know, I'm going to go crazy if you tell me, you know, I have to become Hamlet. And I got to spend the rest of my life trying to become Hamlet. Uh, you know, give me a give me a part in the play. I'm going to give it my best shot. Uh, if you think I'm I've gotten as much from this part as I can at this point in my life, good. Then I'm going to go on with your approval, sir. Uh, to the next go on my next play, my next part. Uh, is one challenge after another that challenges us to be fully present. When we're talking about being fully present, we're not being fully present. We're someplace else. Uh, <laughs> I think Ram Dass, Bernie, Bernie, Bernie and Ram Dass are pretty close. I think Ram Dass wrote a book uh, called Be Here Now. Uh, Bernie's koan that he offered to us is don't be here now. Try that. Yep. Hold on. Um, I would like to embarrass myself right now. Um, I just came from the doctor, and and um, so I'm 76 years old. And one thing I've enjoyed with struggles and confusion and awkwardness is sexual expression and the intimacy the physical, the emotional, the whole around sexual connection with another human being. At 76, I now have uh, an enlarged prostate and I am taking a drug, which is doing wonders in terms of dealing with, <laughs> dealing with the prostate enlargement. But one of the side effects is... Um, Essentially, my libido is gone. And and so one of my koans right now is, oh, this is interesting <laughs> um, to accept and embrace and be without, not entirely, but to be without libido, to be um, very changed since taking the drug. And, and yet... Uh, I think it's okay to take the drug, <laughs> given. So it is embarrassing, you know. I, I'm. It's embarrassing to admit this, and yet, it also is. This is what's going on. I've been working with something not dissimilar about being old, you know. Uh, and I had the realization that this experience of being old, and I think this may be happening, maybe a similar thing may be happening with you, yeah. is when I say I'm old or something, you know, whatever the sentence is, I'm making a comparison. I'm making a comparison between how I am now and my memory or fantasy of how I used to be, or I'm making a comparison with how I am now and how I'm afraid I'm going to be sometime in the future. Uh, 
And that comparison stuff, that's dualistic thinking. That's always a trap. Very hard to let go of it. Bernie used to say pretty much impossible to fully let go of it. Uh, you know, Bernie would say that that's the way our brains work. We think dualistically. You know, we can be aware of it. We can let it go for longer or shorter moments. But it always creeps back in. But just noticing it. This is dualistic thinking. Uh, I got up early and went out for my walk this morning because I wanted to try to beat the heat. So I was out walking at 6.15. Uh, and I managed for a good chunk of the walk to let go of comparing how I was walking today with how I was walking a year ago and was able to just walk. Uh, and that was, that, that was pretty cool. Uh, We only have a we only have a few minutes left. I just want to take a quick look at the book with you. Uh, we're we're going to go on next week uh, to uh, Egyoku, Wendy Nakao, uh, who is the now recently retired, I guess fairly recently retired abbot of ZCLA. Uh, And there were there were a few a few successors uh, who shared two cases, two stories, two Bernie stories. But we're only going to I think in most as far as I know only do one from each person. So the first the first day Gyoku case is on page 17 with the commentary on page 18 of the Bernie Cohen's. Uh, so that's what we're gonna do next week. No, two weeks, right? Jeff, two weeks? Yes, uh, we're, we're every two weeks. And it, it, since you've asked, maybe I'll just remind everybody and you can write these down. So we'll be uh, July 24, August 6, August 22, and September 4. Um, and they're not always on Wednesday. They, they move move back and forth a couple of times because we had other things scheduled. So, But it's roughly every two weeks at the same time. Same Zoom link, too. I'm optimistic about the schedule. Uh, but I haven't cleared it with my cardiologist. Uh, so two, two, two things are, you know, in the, on the horizon. Uh, one is I, some point have to go back to get two more stents. Uh, and the other is sort of in between this, these things, uh, we got to try to get a little vacation in. Vacation, I don't think will interrupt because uh, I don't think we're going to travel all that far this summer. So wherever we are, I should be able to Zoom. Uh, and during my more rec recent you know, hospitalizations this winter, I did manage from my hospital room to to zoom so uh and, and unless the anesthesiologist has his hands on me at a scheduled time i i expect to be here but uh 
you know, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> uh, we got five minutes. Anybody want to get the last word? Go I'd on. like to jump in if I may. Yes. Um, so I don't know if anyone understood my response uh, to become the koan, but I turned my camera off. And then I realized that it actually was making me self-conscious. So I'm in an embarrassing moment right now. And so I raised my hand to call attention to it. Hello. I'm feeling very strange. I have a, a heat in the front of my body and my heart is beating. And um, I feel out of my depth here. And uh, I wanted to share that vulnerability with you. Um, uh, thank you. Well, you sound wonderful. And you looked wonderful before. And I think it's probably if you have if it's not too frightening, it's probably fine for you to turn your camera back on. You look great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, 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 I you just like to say um, thank you so much to everyone. It's just really precious to be able to actually be with real people and the essence of each of you really comes through. And my son always says, how can you do this? It's so impersonal. I said, no, it's just the opposite. It's very intimate to be on Zoom. Each person's full self is there. And I really sense all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I tell a quick story before we end? I don't know. I think maybe not. I think that may uh, be an ending note. It's about a Korean Zen master and just walking. Uh, no. All yeah. right. Some no, other if time. It's a if it's a story about you, okay. No. No. Okay. Uh, Dale, I just wanted to say I'm really impressed with your doggo back there. What a what a beautiful example of uh, peace. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's my dead. he's my biggest follower. <laughs> Did you uh, change your koan from "I am a patient" to "I am what"? From last last the last uh, your, your koan was yes. "I am a patient." Uh, you know, it keeps changing. Uh, uh, right at right at the moment, uh, although this is frightening, I seem to be a Zen teacher. Uh, uh, thanks to you, uh, you know. It, one one side of the Zen teacher koan is like, how what makes you a Zen teacher? Uh, and you know, it's like, what is there about me? Is you know, the essence of Ken that makes him a Zen teacher. There's nothing about the essence of Ken that I know of that makes me a Zen teacher. Bernie said I was a Zen teacher. That's what makes me a Zen teacher in our lineage. But there's another side of it. Uh, you know, uh, which is, you know, a twist on, there's a, a, a line in the, in the Tao. Uh, when the student is ready, the teacher will come. Uh, you know, it's the, the, the converse or whatever that is, is true too, I think. When the teacher is ready, the students will come. So the fact that you all are here, I guess I'm a teacher. Uh, and thank you. It's, Bernie would be very happy. <laughs> See you all in two weeks. <laughs>